uh, of thorium was considered since the very beginning of nuclear energy. I am writing a book, in fact, on nuclear reactor history, and I discovered that there was a new pile committee established in 1944, April. I have the report of this by Enrico Fermi and so on, uh, with two Nobel Prize, uh, Eugène Wigner, three Nobel Prize, Enrico Fermi, and James Frank. Um, and it was said, written, that more work should be done on nuclear development of thorium. So this committee also suggested experiment to develop reactors that would convert thorium to uranium-233. Then, it was said several times, there is a long story of thorium. Uh, there was first a symposium or a conference. The first one was in 1962. Unfortunately, I have not the proceedings, but I have the proceedings of the second one, which was held in Gettlingburg in 1966. 66. It was written, it is time to take a fresh look at the reason for working on the thorium fuel cycle and its long-range prospects. Myself, I made my PhD 40 years ago with Jules Rovitz on, uh, on thorium. It was at Saclay, 73, exactly 40 years ago. It was in November, a high-temperature reactor. So thorium is not, as you can understand, a new story. It is a very old story. Why thorium? You know this quite well, so I just skip this one. Thorium gives uranium to free free, fission gives energy. I can stop here. Well, it's a little bit more complicated. It has been said many times the important factor to characterize the interest of thorium is the eta factor, which is the number of neutrons you recover when one neutron is absorbed in the fission nucleus. So let's compare the properties of uranium-233 compared to uranium-235 when you have a neutrons going in the uh, fissile nucleus like uranium-233, it absorbs the neutrons, and in 8% of the cases, it doesn't fission. For uranium-235, it's 15% of the cases. Now it fissions in 92% of the cases and only 85% for uranium-235. You see here that uranium-233 is better than uranium-235. And this is characterized by what we call the eta factor, which is, once again, the number of neutrons you obtain when one neutron is absorbed in the fissile nucleus. It's 2.3, about 2.3 for uranium-233, and hardly greater than 2, 208, 207 for uranium-235. This is a big difference. So here again are the value, uh, the value of eta for the main fissile isotopes, and from now you can see that uranium-233 is the best, the best, fissile isotope in thermal range. And the best one for fast neutron is plutonium. All the history, I would say, of nuclear reactor is here, I mean, of the fast breeder reactor. It's behind these figures. This explains why, partly, why the plutonium is the best uh, fissile isotope, once again, for fast breeder reactor. Well, uranium-233 is not so bad, but less good than uh, plutonium. You can breed only if eta is greater than two. One neutron to sustain the reaction chain, and the other one to make a new fissile isotope. So you need to have eta at least equal to two. It is as simple as this. So the difference for uranium-235 the difference with two is very low, only 0, uh, 0.07. And here the difference is 0.3. This makes, once again, a big difference. And this is the reason why you can imagine, and it was done, 
breeding in thermal breeder reactor, in thermal reactor, which is almost, which is impossible with uranium-235, and which is possible with uranium-233. Okay, but thorium is not a substitute to natural uranium. Thorium is not a substitute to natural uranium. One can sustain a reaction chain with natural uranium. With thorium, we cannot. In other words, if uranium had not existed on the Earth, probably we would not be here. Thorium occurrence in nature has been discussed several times here, but let me say, sorry to be a little bit provo provocative, thorium reserves is not the problem. This is not the problem. Why? Because I say, uh, Professor Rubia this morning was one ton of uranium, of uh, thorium, of, well, let me say, let me explain this. Remind these figures, only one figure to remind. To make one gigawatt electric du during one year, you need one ton of fission. To make one gigawatt electric during one year, you need one ton of fission. One ton of fission. So if you transform, let's say, one million ton of thorium into uranium-233, and if you fission it, you have one million gigawatt electric years. So you have nuclear energy for thousands of years. That's true. This is not, you know, a ridiculous idea. That's true. Once again, whatever the thorium, million tons is sufficient anyway to sustain nuclear energy with thorium. Provided that, of course, you transform it uranium to free-free and you fission it. The same thing for uranium, by the way. Well, I, I, I skip on this one ju ju just to... Uh, there are four possibilities to use thorium. Four. Not three, not five, four. First is use uranium to free-free. Thorium has been used in the past. I remember I worked at General Atomic Company in, the, in California at that time, and the basic thorium cycle was based on high enriched uranium. It was said in some of the slides, 93%. Suddenly, Jimmy Carter, president, arrived in power and said, well, no more high enriched uranium in reactor. It's a very preferred. General Atomic was in a bad situation at that time. They said, well, what, what, what we are going to invent? And they said, well, we are going to invent uh, low enriched uranium, medium enriched uranium, which is 20% uranium, which is a mixture of thorium and MAU cycle, and uh, mid enriched. It's possible to do this. I made a lot of study myself on this, but, well, we can discuss. Not, not very attractive. Second is to use uranium 233, which is the best, which is a nirvana, you know. Ah. Very, but you must have it first. You have to produce it. And the fourth solution is to mix it with plutonium. I think this is the only way immediately in the next 10 years to start, uh, to start a thorium cycle. Well, this is a bus, this has been said several times. The pioneers, the high temperature reactor, thorium has been used as at least 15 reactor. The list was given several times, so I skip this one. The results also have been, there have been, you know, tons and tons of that thick studies on thorium in the past, so um, I will skip this one. I prefer to take time to discuss a particular point. So, um, breeding condition can be achieved, at least on the paper, it has been done at, at the shipping port, the reactor, as was mentioned, but with complicated uh, system, uh, which would be difficult to extrapolate to commercial reactors. On the paper, it's possible. But what you can achieve is near what we call near breeder reactor, which is a reactor with a conversion ratio close to 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.95. And from this uh, start, it's very, already very interesting to, have to uh, implement thorium. For fast breeder, it's questionable. You, you can discuss this. But the physics say that, unfortunately, thorium cross-section a normal fast breeder reactor is three times less than the one of uranium-233, and uranium-233, uh, sorry, than uranium-238. And, well, uranium-233 has not outstanding properties. So, fast breeder reactor with thorium is, well, I mean, not, not so interesting. 
compared to uranium-plutonium cycle, except putting thorium on the blanket that is based on the Indian program, which is really a good idea. I mean, this is a nice program, the three-stage program. I mean, this is the best compromise we can find by combining thermal reactors with high conversion ratio and fast breeder reactor. Really very good. Well, this one has been said several times also. Sorry to be a, a little bit fast, but uh, advantages, melting point, chemical stability. I skip this one, you understand. Uh, it has been said once again. Industrial challenges. Mining, roughly speaking, not a big challenge, except a little bit more irradiating material you have to mani manipulate before, uh, before processing it. Uh, the tailings are less a problem than the uranium, uh, I mean, waste from mines because of the uh, uh, Toron is uh, half-life one minute instead of eight days for Radon. But it's a detail, I and mean, it's not a big, well, really big issue. Fuel manufacture, I took this one from India. Um, there is an experience. It's possible to fabricate thorium fuel. There's no problem, even at industrial scale. This is a main, the main message from this. Um, well, the issue of uranium-232, th this, is this has been also presented once again, but it's just to remind how uranium-232 is formed. There are three different ways from nuclear standpoint uh, to fabricate. But the main problem is here. Thallium-208 is a very intensive gamma, very energetic. Don't put in your hand a piece of uranium-233, which is possible, uranium-235, you can take it in your hand, even pure. Don't do this with uranium-233. You will, you know, not die immediately, but uh, it's very highly radioactive. I mean, I mean gamma, uh, gamma emission, because as of not uranium-233 it's itself, but it is mixed with uranium-232. There is a drawback for this, is for the fabrication of fuel, but it is possible with remote handling system. And there is um, an advantage for this, is for proliferation resistance. I will come back on this point in five minutes. Maybe you will be surprised. Um, reprocessing. Uh, you have been uh, told many technical things on this. It's more challenges because of the dissolution is more, but it is feasible. It is another story if you want to make it at the industrial scale. You have to make enough R&D. You know, we, at the high plant we make 10 or 20 years of R&D. On, on, the, on the paper it is relatively easy to dissolve uh, uranium fuel in nitric acid. You put it in a you know, vessel, put nitric acid, put the fuel, it dissolves, and it gives you, at an Israel, it, it gives you a high plant. So when you go to industrial scale, it's a different story. You are making a lot of R&D, but it's feasible. As I said, we have reprocessed 30,000 tons of fuel in the Hague with using, um, uh, using Purex. Carlo is not here, unfortunately, but he said that Purex is, you know, not good, but it's, it works. Uh, as I said, refabrication of uh, uranium-233 bearing fuel is not so easy, but it was, it was made 40 years ago. With the present technology, it's, it's a question of cost, but technically it's not impossible, you know, of course. We have the technology. When you see the, how max fuel are fabricated is behind glove boxes in almost automatic, uh, automatic devices. Complicated, but feasible. Waste and non-proliferation. Is it the first time you see this curve? <laughs> I don't think so. Each presentation you see this curve. It is uh, what we call, in fact, you know, you have to, since you, it's very well-known curve, you have to know here is a sievert per gigawatt electric uh, year. It's in French, sorry. It's what we call the radiotoxic inventory. If you eat the waste each morning, 
in your, with your coffee. What's happening? It's happening this. You die if, you know, because it's highly radioactive. So there has been hundreds and hundreds of papers and scenario on this issue. Roughly speaking, it is true to say that if you have thorium cycled with uranium-233, clearly there are less minor actinides. That's clear. It is simple. It is physics. Because americium, curium, and neptunium are simply produced by, almost, by plutonium. So if you remove plutonium, you have no more minor actinides, of course. <laughs> if you have uranium-233. But you, for that, you have to uh, implement a thorium uranium 233 cycle, which is not for tomorrow. You have just first to begin with plutonium at least, and with plutonium to generate my minor actinides. Okay, so it is not so simple to say, well, it's a waste free uh, cycle. That's not true. And anyway, the, 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 the bulk of the waste are fission products. Yeah? Minor actinides, of course, are important because they are long-lived and uh, alpha emitters. But, once again, you generate, at, at least during decades, first decades of implementing thorium, you generate minorite. After that, it's okay. No problem. So, here you have an example, just one example of uh, comparison with uranium. This comes from uh, the, the protactinium-231, but anyway, it's under the natural uranium radioactivity. So, after a few tens of thousands of years, this is not an issue, because you are, you know, it's very low uh, radioactive. Another question is, I am provocative, it, is it necessary to separate and uh, mine our actinides? And some probably leave it underground, I mean, it's not a big issue. It's another discussion, we can discuss this also. Proliferation. Again, tank nuclear weapons, I've been involved in this during many years in this area, so nuclear weapons, so I know a little bit on this topic. Again, type nuclear weapons is feasible. What is a Gantt type? You have just two half sphere of fission material, you do this and you make an explosion. It was a Hiroshima bomb. The principle is very simple. It is very simple. The problem is to have the fission material. Look at this. It was a test made in 1955 with the nuclear weapons made of uranium-233. Partly. There was a little bit of plutonium, I don't enter into the design, but mainly the fission material was uranium-233. So don't tell me that it's impossible to make a nuclear weapon with uranium-233. It's proliferation resistant. Oh, it's okay, I, I will tell you that. Nobody say that, but when you hear when a politicians are, uh, you know, heard that, uh, well, it's a waste-free proliferation resistance. Well, oh my goodness, that's fantastic. This is the answer to, the, to your question. All proliferation pathways are not easy to implement, and this should make thorium cycle a little bit more, a little bit more proliferation. There has been here a studies, I mean here by um, Mr. Bruno Pelot, uh, a study on this, on the proliferation resistance of thorium fuel cycle. It was made on the, sorry to say that, but on methodology that I developed myself, which is called, called SAPRA, a simplified approach for proliferation resistance assessment of nuclear energy system. The method that I developed, you apply this method to assess the proliferation resistance. It was that thick report. Unfortunately, it's not public report because it was uh, ordered by a private company. But anyway, um, the conclusion of this, depending on the scenario, uh, you can make it more proliferation resistance or less. The problem is, I come back just to this, uranium-232, you know, which makes difficult to handle uranium-233 uh, sphere, which is true, but you can make uranium-233 with very low content of uranium-232. It has been done. American did fabricate 400 kilograms, 400, which is 20 times a critical mass. You can make 
20 nuclear weapons with this, with very low content of uranium-232, very low, very low, 7 ppm instead of 1,000. So you can handle it like this. Don't know. Maybe, yeah, I know, but okay. But it's possible. If you put thorium in, sorry if they had, in thorium in a blanket of fast breeder reactor, you have the very low content of uranium-232. It's like plutonium, uh, weapon-grade plutonium from putting uranium-238 in blanket of fast breeder. So, uh, my message here is to be careful of any, you know, very big statement, that's like non-proliferation, waste, and so on. Be careful. It's not so simple. I don't enter the details of, of the economy, but I made also a, uh, some economic... I just want to underline that it is true, if you put thorium tomorrow, um, uh, if you implement in thorium... Yeah, okay, that's okay. I will finish in one minute. Maybe. Um, first, you have, you have already 25,000 tons of thorium available on the world. 9,000 tons is available in France. With this, you can start tens and tens of thorium reactors. Tens and tens of thorium may be started tomorrow without any mining of thorium. 25,000 tons. Okay, and it's already available. So the thorium, once again, is not a problem. Of course, you have not to enrich uranium. So it's an economy. The problem is the back end, which is a little bit more expensive. So, so you have just one point. The chemical part of reprocessing, the chemical part, the, the core of the process in reprocessing plant is only, I would say, 20, 25 percent of the total cost of reprocessing. All the rest is head end part, uh, you know, uh, uh, many, uh, well, dissolving and, and so on, and treating the waste and vitrification and plutonium uh, management and many things. So if you have, I have the cost, detailed cost of the Hague plant, I, I can tell you the, the figure are true, and the chemical part, even its double price to process thorium, it's, it's not the big influence of the reprocessing uh, cost. Okay? Status of the art is being said, well, it is written here. Um, Conclusion, takeaway points. I had three or three slides of takeaway points. I just skip it because of time. So my main conclusion is, it's not this one. Well, this one is relatively optimistic. I think thorium cycle presents real attractive feature, really. And it needs to have R&D on this. But do not exaggerate and make thorium a miracle. It is not a miracle. It is interesting option for the future. I am quite convinced of this. And it, 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 tomorrow, when it is done today, uh, in this frame, the priority is to develop and qualify a fuel for, tomorrow, for today's reactors. We have to go progressively. I think there's a future for thorium. I'm quite convinced of this once again. But don't tell every, you know, every uh, decision maker in the newspaper that thorium is a miracle. It's against our, you know, our, uh, uh, that we defend. Because once, one day they will, you said there is no waste. Well, look at this. There's waste. Non proliferation, well, we have been told by specialists that sometimes you can make. So, wait a So, you will be, you know, completely, uh, in French, discredité, discredited uh, by when the people. So, you have to explain the things. It was done, by the way. I, I did appreciate very much a presentation from India, which was very realistic and they have a very good program. This is my feeling. Sorry for that, but uh, I would like to conclude here. How, how would you include the ADS systems in your story? Well, often, you know, thorium is linked to ADS. I said, there's no, you speak about ADS without speaking thorium. I mean, this is another, another problem. This is a question of uh, reactor technology. The interest or not of ADS, uh, I think it's a good question. I'm not going to discuss here the advantage and the disadvantage there are, there are not. It's an interesting project, but it's not directly linked to thorium. Sorry, to the, to the topic of thorium. I mean, you, you can, the, the past reactor was not ADS. Uh, we, we put thorium in other things than ADS. If there is a good uh, 
mariage, how do you say that? Uh, good, you know, uh, complementarity between IDS and thorium, it's okay. But, uh, well, my, my feeling about, I have my own feeling about IDS, but I, I don't want to, to discuss in details here because it's a little bit long. Uh, the only thing uh, I would like to say is it's simply about the coast. You, well, I said, well, I said that I'm not going to say something, but I'm going to say something. Now, once again, it is, when it's claim everywhere that ADS are very safe, I said that this morning, you know, it's make me very angry, you know. The, when you have a fission, you have two fission products, okay? These two fission products release energy, whatever the system is, whatever the system. And this makes the residual power. If there was not this, there, was, there would not, not be Fukushima, TMI, or even, well, Chernobyl was another problem, but anyway. Uh, everywhere you are still the residual power, even in ADS. For a given amount of energy, one fission is 200 MeV, is neutrons, and is release of, of uh, residual power. Free things fission, you know, is physics. So you have to remove the residual power, otherwise you go to the big accident. That's as simple as this. Of course, you can imagine uh, more, or less, uh, more or less efficient as is air-cooled or uh, in ADS, which, which is a fine idea. But don't tell me that much safer or less safer than that. You, may, you can imagine systems, as it was imagined by ADS, air-cooled, natural air-cooling systems or even, which are better. If you say it is safer, you are going to remove the containment? And you are going to, put to go to the safety authority saying, well, I have an ultra-safe reactor. I don't need a containment. You know the answer. Well, you say that both uranium and thorium uh, could uh, complement each other. In, in the present days, where uranium-235 uh, uh, exists in, uh, in, uh, in big amounts, but uh, the future of thorium is tomorrow when uh, uranium-235 has to be replaced. So, so the fight will be then with thorium and uranium-238. So it is in, in this uh, perspective that uh, the, the debate has to be... Uh, well, I, uh, once again, after it is right, you, you know all the figures today, we have 7 million tons of uranium. We, uh, the consumption is about 60,000 tons per year today, so it's 100 tons, it's 100 years or 200 years of uranium. If you stay to this, at the constant nuclear energy level, it's only once or two centuries of uranium. And after that, go away, for a constant. If you imagine the deployment of nuclear doubling or tripling, of course, there are two solutions. Either you find additional Reserves of uranium, which is possible. People say there are plenty of uranium. We didn't discover it. That's possible. That's possible. That's an option. There will be debate about this. And the second uh, possibility is that we do not discover additional and we develop nuclear energy. In that case, of course, thorium would be an interesting option, except if you develop the fast breeder reactors with, ura with uh, plutonium uranium. Uh, we, we, we come back to my one, tons, one gigawatt electric. Yes. Seven, seven million tons of uranium, if it is transformed into plutonium, yes. and if you fission it, yes. Yes. you have nuclear energy for 7,000 years. It is true, I mean, it is as simple as this. The equation is not complicated. We have not to make differential, integral, and whatever, actualization, and uh, it is as simple as this. Yeah, but, but then thorium has his, his main advantages in, this, yes, in that because, case. Yes, yeah. well, if, yeah, it is what, what I said, you know, maybe, maybe in competition because of many uh, good characteristics of thorium, like no physical, uh, and, uh, maybe yeah. less waste in that case because of thorium range. And the, the, the scenario of India is, uh, is once again very good. I'm not especially paid by India. But okay, let's take somebody from India to comment on this. I think it's nobody's case, uh, at least I didn't hear, that uh, thorium has no problems and uranium has all the problems. I, I, I think that is not the issue. The issue is, there are some unresolved issues with uranium. 
now if the nuclear power has to grow we have to find answer to those issues uh, there may be many other alternatives i thought in the context of this meeting let's examine whether thorium can help alleviate some of those problems now that may be in the context of a little better proliferation resistance that may be in the context of uh, uh, easing uh, the recycle which makes larger energy available mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth clearly uh, the days when nuclear energy began there are several options related to thorium which were not available because the burn up yeah. that one could get in those days was small today even in light water reactors you can get high enough burn up to get those advantages out of thorium yeah. so it's only that comparison and nothing more than that yeah. that's i thought i, agree, I just yeah. mentioned that fully agree yeah thank you for thank you for okay. these words of uh, wisdom i almost would uh,